I heard Roger Klotz was actually at the Capitol insurrection. That's just a rumor. Uh, I heard <laughs> Not 100% sure. Oh, that makes me laugh. <laughs> I want my freedom. I want my freedom to ruin things and wreck everything. <laughs> oh, my God. That just made it's my happening. nightmare. Tokyo tonight. Hey. What's going on, man? Uh, you know, I'm not bleeding from any holes, so I must be doing okay. <laughs> it's actually a requirement we make of all our guests. You do. We're like, are you guys, are you doing all right? Are you bleeding from any holes? <laughs> and if they say no, we let them on. <laughs> it's pretty much how it goes. Dude, congratulations. Um, Futurama's coming back. That's huge. Yes. Um, and all, and you just told me Ren and Stimpy, which I did not know, which I'm so now excited for. Yeah, it's pretty funny that and ironic that the two of them would just come back around the same time. Yeah. Um, one of them, I mean, God, I did Ren and Stimpy about 28 years ago or something. Yeah, man. So when I go to conventions, there's guys in their full dress uniforms that just get back from the Air Force doing missions over Afghanistan. And they were little boys when when they watch the stuff that I did and they were, and they told me they do, even when they're doing drills in combat, they're, they're doing routines from Futurama over the, you know, wow. shut up, take my money. <laughs> you know, I don't want to live on this planet anymore. <laughs> you know, but they were little boys. I mean, God yeah. dang. Oh my God. That yeah. must be insane. To this day, I don't know why, but I will randomly say to people, and either they get it or they don't. I'll just randomly be like, "You whizzed on the electric fence, didn't you?" <laughs> and out of the, and it's one of my, I, I have that theme in my head, and I have that episode like down pat in my head completely. Yeah, Weird. boy, that was fun. Oh man, yeah, I mean, it was fun. It was, um, it was a good, um, it was a good um, animated project that I, I liked at the time. There was a renaissance blossoming yeah there was um the simpsons yeah and then came um ren and stimpy and it was in no way like the simpsons and then there was beavis and butthead which was in no way like either of the previous right and and that's the way things should be it shouldn't be somebody strikes gold and then everybody wants to be first to be second to do something you know right that's, that's hollywood but yeah um you know uh I, I just, you know, you're hoping for originality. And so mm. I kind of got my wish or whatever I was hoping for out nice. of being able to do those shows. Yeah. Did you feel the subversion of those shows at the time? Because when I was a kid, it felt really, really cool to be watching those kind of cartoons. Like you knew you shouldn't be watching them. And there was some stuff in Red and Stimpy that was over my head. Oh, as yeah. A kid. But like, did you guys feel it when you were making it, when it, when it was going on, when you were doing the voices? Yes. <laughs> of course. No, I mean, I, I, I said, uh, they weren't cartoons. They were cries for help. <laughs> That's and great. so if any parent was stupid enough to let the TV be the babysitter of their kid, then you get what you deserve. Hey, some of us become comedians. So. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I know. Just <laughs> you know, you don't remind me of, see, my problem with a lot of people is that when they were growing up, their parents made deals with them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so they never were told no. They always like struck a deal. You know, what have you been doing deals at seven years old? You I know. know. Yeah, that's and those, that's those parents, weird. shame on them because they, they raised a, a bunch of monsters. Christ. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, honestly, it's like, you know, um, hey, you just stepped on my foot. Aren't you going to say anything? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I was. My, my parents are Italian, man. So it was one of those things where, like, if you were acting up in a store, they'd be like, if you don't fucking stop crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. Yeah, grab you by the nose and go, strozy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just had no idea they meant the economy like 20 years later. I was like, that's a good threat. It's <laughs> a real good threat. Really good threat. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, holy shit, it can't actually panned out. No, but, you know, it, it's like, I, I think uh, that's why there's a lot of people that aren't able to handle anything. Yeah, yeah. Outside their two thumbs that control things right. on gadgets, you know what I mean? It's like uh, I've seen a lot of people just shatter and break down and act out, and and you go, they're going from zero to sixty. What the hell is this? It's because their parents were making friggin' deals with them. Oh my god, I know. It's so yeah. it's so horrible when you see it in public, and you're just like, and you want to be the one that you're like, can I? discipline your child <laughs> can i do it can i discipline your mother <laughs> you know, that's what i'm going to title this episode are, are infantilized just like the kids are oh yeah absolutely it's but i weird. have to tell you but i have to tell you i have to take heart because i i do so many um comic cons and mm. science fiction and anime car uh com uh what do you call it uh, conventions conventions yeah and um the people i meet are the nicest people you'd ever ever want to see mm -hmm. um they they come to just to say hi and thank you and and i'm i'm like i'm so grateful right um you talk to any of us like you know tom kenny or you know does spongebob whenever we're together talking that's the first thing that comes up is how lucky are we yeah yeah i yeah. mean the, the odds against any kind of success like this are a billion to one and and I've been doing this for 40 years. I've never been out of work. Right. Wow. So I'm real lucky. Do you, um, it is one of those things that comes across, by the way, which is always nice for the fan and for people who want to be in that profession as well to see from you guys, like how appreciative you are, like how, like, like you said, you feel lucky, which I feel like sometimes when you see people in, in Hollywood or stuff like that, or especially on those award shows, they kind of, yes. kind of a smugness to them that kind of is off putting. But yes. like anytime I've seen any of you guys talk about your work, or you know just the business in general you always exude enthusiasm and joy for the fans and for what you're doing and it's great well um i i will talk to people i mean and i'll spend time with them the promoters are always like hey can you move it along hey can you go fuck yourself <laughs> <laughs> you know, i, I want to talk to people yeah yeah because i would not know what's going on out in the world unless i did you know right yeah. i go to bed at eight o'clock <laughs> You know you can stay up as late as you want now, right? You're in, um, <laughs> yeah, somebody told me that. They said, how old are you? I said, 70. Do you know you can do anything you want? Oh, wow. I can't believe, dude, you look great. I can't believe you're 70. Oh, you thanks. Great. Holy shit. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know what I love, too, is, and I wonder, I, I mean, this must be really flattering to you, but every article I've read about you, I mean, I've followed your career since I, you know, since I could read, which is yesterday, basically, but um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a quick learner. Uh, but yeah. I, but they, they always compare you to Mel Blanc. Is that, was that one of your heroes? Is that a guy that you, you admired growing up? Yeah, he was one of my heroes. I mean, he was, um, he was the guy that lit the way mm -hmm. for the rest of us. I mean, um, I remember when I was a small kid in Detroit, Michigan, and, and I was watching these cartoons and, and we got them from Canada because uh, Detroit had a station that would come in channel nine. It didn't come in too good. Hmm. So it was like snowy and, but, but you could hear it. Right. And that's kind of all that mattered to me is I could hear these voices. And I said, this is some kind of magic, man. I mean, I was, I was like blown away molecularly mm -hmm. when I first heard Mel Blanc. I mean, yeah. Uh, and then there were others that I began to kind of, become aware of like Don Messick and Dawes oh, Butler. And, so good. Yeah. And they were all my heroes, all of them, June Foray. Yeah. And the funniest thing is um, whenever I get to work with one of my heroes, I've been lucky enough to meet almost all my heroes, but I've also gotten to work with some of them. And they always say something to the effect of um, where you've been, you know, we've been saving a seat for you. Wow. Yeah, that's really nice. That's what I tell aspiring voice people. They go, I want to do what you do. Because no one gave a shit about this. Right. You know, years ago, I mean, there were no signs. You know, right. 
this way to do voiceovers or there were no classes. There were no schools. There was no nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And people said, how did you get into it? I said, I was a freak when I was a little <laughs> kid. I was a freak. I used to run around toretting out voices and noises and everybody was like, can you not do that? You know, me, 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 me. <laughs> and, um, and I said, it's one of those things you don't consciously choose it. It kind of chooses you and you <laughs> yeah. got to go with it. Right. You know, and I think people understand that when I tell them, that's the only way I can explain it. It's something that you don't have a lot of choice in. It's like, it'll gnaw at you and eat at you. Why? I know it's silly to do these things, but, but there's gotta be something to it. There's gotta be some, uh, impetus that's coming from you that you're not getting. And then one day it all kind of clicks. Yeah. Cause it's cold out there alone. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, you know, what's crazy too, is like, there's a lot of voice actors and like a lot of the guys that you mentioned, which is funny because like, they look like some of them look like who they're voicing, which uh -huh. is always, which I loved as a kid kind of discovering that. And yes. uh, like Alan Reed looks like Fred, you know what yes, I mean? Like he does. looks like a, and, it, and it's crazy. You see that guy and you're like, of course that guy's Fred Flintstone. Of course, yes. <laughs> you know, would you, is there a character that you identify with more than another one though? Cause you've done so many and I don't, I can't quite figure out who you I don't know, you know who I look like. I mean, I've or who you relate to more, maybe. I'd have to pull my lip. Try, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's what I would. I would say that too. Shut up and take my money. <laughs> um, no, so I make great. faces. I can't help it. It's just all part of. Um, pulling the character out of out of your ass you know it's like yeah. um yeah the professor was 147 years old so good and uh i said jesus he must fart dust you know <laughs> I, made all, I made him all rickety and you know and i kind of do that sometimes like you know right i don't want to live on this planet anymore <laughs> that's you like know, one of my and I, and I here comes matt graining and company mm -hmm. The brilliant Matt Groening, who I was so in awe of when I got to audition for him, and I thought long and hard before I opened my mouth with any of these characters, because here's this committee yeah. of brilliant people that have developed something, honed it, know that it's going to work, and they got to find somebody to interpret it. And they hold a picture in front of me and go, what would you do? Oh, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, real easy. Yeah, no pressure. Um, so I mean, I went off the pictures themselves, and I and I learned to, to like if I get a gut feeling about something, I usually go with it because, right. you know, you the longer you listen to your gut feelings, you realize they're telling you the truth. Yeah, and to not question it, just you know, go with it. You know, even if even if you're not selling it, I mean, commit to it. You'll get it. Yeah. Yeah. Did it, how long did it take you before you got to that point? Like when you were starting out to when you were like, okay, you know what? I know I'm going to listen to my gut. Um, I think, uh, I think that happened after I moved from Boston to, uh, New York. I moved in 1989. Nice. And I was working on the Howard Stern show doing characters and, you know, imitations or whatever was in the news. I would just, you know, pop up and start riffing with it yeah um but i um i had to learn what worked and what didn't in that mm -hmm. particular situation and that was rough it's cold in there man i, I mean, can imagine yeah especially rough. at the height i mean that was like when he was like howard howard you know what i mean not apologetic right. uh, a lot of controversy right but he liked me and um you know and i mean i have nothing bad to say uh yeah um, I needed a job when I came to New York and that guy gave me a job. So that's fantastic. You know, I never are forget you, that. Are you guys still close? Um, not really. I haven't seen anybody in years and years and years, like almost 30 years. Wow. Did you, yeah, everybody seems to think that I'm somehow still there or something. And <laughs> you just show up to work the next day and they're like, what's up? Robin, what happened? Billy's a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Robin, oh. I just farted. <laughs> <laughs> did, <laughs> did you like, did you, because that was more like you were working with other people at the time. When you're doing these other voices, you're alone when you do them, right? Um, 
You mean in cartoon? Yeah, in cartoons yeah. and stuff like that. You're basically in a booth by Not yourself. Not always. I mean, yeah, you are basically by yourself if you're doing commercials. Sometimes you work with another person. But um, with Ren and Stimpy, it was just me doing the voices pretty much. Yeah. So I worked, uh, you know, uh, by myself with right. a director. Do you prefer collaborating with other people in the room? I absolutely do. Yeah. I absolutely do. Because all my peers, you have no idea how right. much respect I've got for them. Um, you know, uh, it, it's like, it's hard to describe what it's like to wake up in the morning and go walk into a room full of genius level talent. I mean, right. it's, it's like, yeesh. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and you see somebody doing extremely well, like firing on all cylinders and you, and it, and it makes you want to up your game. It's not competition. It's just, especially with voice people versus celebrities, is we're trying to keep the bar off the ground. Yeah. You know, and the celebrities come in and just take it off the thing and throw it on the floor. Where's my $10 million? Oh, my God, yeah. Yeah, and I yeah. I guess I'm, I'm an elder statesman at this point. But yeah. I've been saying it for years. I said that, you know, it's stunt casting. It's like they think it's going to put asses in the seats. Um, it's a shame, man. Well, everybody thinks that there's a formula mm -hmm. for everything until somebody does something that there is no way to, to figure out how they did it and it becomes huge. So then they try to break it down and anal spectrum analyze its success and try to, you know, yeah. uh, reconstitute it somehow by co-opting certain DNA from it. I mean, you know, it's always been like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, it, that's something you guys still kind of are, are struggling with and stuff like that too. Cause I know there's some stuff going on with Futurama and um, uh, you know, John Imaggio and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's like, and is it, do you feel like all voice actors kind of stick together in that way though? Like, do you guys have a front that you can put up to defend yourselves and stuff? Or is, do you think it's more, you know, individual still and kind of um, like. You can't expect other people to go to bat for you right you know what i mean it's like um i'm not management yeah yeah yeah. and yeah. i'm a hired gun i have gotten together with people when we agreed to get together sure then hold a solidarity like we used to get together me and maurice lamarge and katie and mm -hmm. um you know tress and and john and myself and and we'd say listen this is what we want to do but I got no phone calls. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. You know, and then all of a sudden I find out that I'm supposed to be co-negotiating with somebody. And I said, oh, cripes, you know, it's like uh, we did our deals. And uh, I just, you know, I hope for the best. That's all. Sure. Yeah, I of course. The best. I mean, we love John. Everybody loves him and everybody loves his character. How could right. you not? But yeah, yeah. I hope he, uh, I hope he, uh, you know, just like figures out a way to to get back to it yeah it seems like everybody's basically the same sentiments where they're like they really hope they're pulling for him hoping that it gets settled without any kind of uh you know hassle you know <clears throat> long time ago i don't even know if this is a story i should tell but the hell with it yeah it's the place to do it yeah because being old is a beautiful thing you don't have to explain shit to anybody <laughs> <laughs> so Love if it. i decide to explain shit to somebody then do yeah. something about it. Was exactly. it just show <laughs> you know, cut it out. Stop saying that. Stuff. Right. Okay, Mr. Showbiz, I promise I'll never do it again. <laughs> um, so um, years ago, we were negotiating and nothing was going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, and so eventually it got to the point where basically they were saying, look, we'll give you whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Me and me. Yeah. And I said, really? But there was a caveat. They said, yeah, but there's a few people that won't be able to come back to the show. Wow. Wow. And I said, okay, um, forget about it. But I just want one thing. And I asked him if I could write an, a song for one of the episodes. Wow. And that's, that's all I got out of that other than what I negotiated. But I mean, they were willing to give me anything and I did it so that everybody could come back to the show. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, awesome. and, and I didn't think any big thing about it. I didn't, I'm not, you know, uh, this hypocritical display of virtue, mm -hmm. you know, it just seemed like 
why do I need to do that? I need these people. Not only are they my friends, but uh, God, I mean, if they're not going to be able to come back to the show because I'm putting some compromise, right? then fuck it. You know, it's yeah. like, yeah. you know, immediately what to do if you have any ethos. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and not only that, you're also, I mean, the, the, you know, you know, those people too, but it's the quality of the show as well too. You know what I mean? It's weird that these executives are always willing to throw stuff basically in one direction and they don't realize that it's a collaborative thing and there's a whole team behind it and people who love it and they're passionate and it's a shame. Yeah. Nobody really knew that I did that either. I wasn't looking for a pat on the back. I right. just, um, this is like the first time I've ever said anything and we're talking about years and years ago. Right like maybe 20 years ago close to that wow man no wow. that's awesome dude that's yeah awesome. and um takes a lot of balls uh, to do something like that well that's what people said to me you're the only guy i've ever met that would do that for anybody right i went to one of these fancy hollywood parties and somebody comes up and goes heard about what you did <laughs> oh, nice <laughs> nice, job. nice job i wouldn't fucking do it but <laughs> <laughs> and that guy's name was no i'm just kidding uh, <laughs> <was> steven seagal, <laughs> steven seagal. <laughs> <laughs> oh god that's great <laughs> thank you <laughs> oh what it, it, i've seen you guys all together like you and other voice actors especially but people that you're working with where you're able to improvise with each other so quickly in those characters how how quickly does that kind of happen is it something after meeting them or working with them for a while or are you guys just that in tune with who those guys are that you could do it at the drop of a hat i never worked with john before mm -hmm. i had worked with maurice lamarche for years and tress mm -hmm. and we were like old timers you know yeah um phil lamar was practically new at doing animation mm -hmm. and so was dave herman i believe but they were experienced comic actors right you know and they both can do different voices they they don't they're not a prisoner of their own stupid voice mm -hmm. you know it's like like a celebrity you know they get paid for being who and exactly what they are yep but, yeah but years ago the producers would be like you know have us come in and they'd say okay there's a bar of lead on the table over there and all we need you to do is turn it to gold for us do you think you could do that <laughs> yeah no problem <laughs> you know, and now it, there's no alchemy. Mm -hmm. If nothing changes, if you have me just, you know, talking like this for a character, I guess it would be novel. But right, um, if I did it every day and every project, it, what, there'd be no alchemy. There'd be no magic. There'd be no lead turning into gold. Right. And uh, when the celebrities come in, they just walk by the lead on the table. And, you know, where's my $10 million? Yep. And, um, and I used to get mad because they would put, you know, hard work and voice over people out of work, but this was something that management insisted on is this is what we're doing. Yeah. You know, whenever I see a movie come out and it's an animated one and I look at the voice list and I don't see one real voice actor on it, I'm like, you're oh, not gonna. this is going to fucking suck. No, you're, <laughs> you're not gonna, but, but the thing is, is, um, someday that movie will be playing and nobody's going to know who the celebrities were. Oh, good point. And, and they're going to go, yeah. why is this so anemic? Yeah. Yeah. You know, compared to like things that are, uh, you know, uh, vocal performer based. Mm -hmm. um, but who cares? Nobody's betting that they're going to be around. I don't think. Do you, do you remember when uh, you were younger, what the first voices that you had done, maybe like cartoon wise, like any animated shows that inspired you? Um, well, I, uh, listened to the radio a lot mm. and I loved the sound of people's voices. I was kind of nonverbal myself. I was tongue tied cause my dad was a screaming fascist, psycho drunk, you know? Yeah. And I was on the autism spectrum and I had no idea that I was, and he just thought I was stupid. So he used to beat the crap out of me every day. Jeez. And, um, so I was like, I was afraid to say anything and I was kind of nonverbal, but I would listen to the guys on the radio, you know, and, and, uh, 
And I'd walk away and I'd be going like, that guy is so cool. This is Johnny Bannon, the human cannon, saying what's in you has got to come out. And that's what rock and roll is all about. Before we eat the slap again, Mr. Roy Oberson, 1961, CBS FM. You know, <laughs> and all of a sudden all this shit could come flying out of me. Right. Um, so I guess that's part of the the autism thing or the ADD yeah. thing. I, I don't know. Uh, we had a great AD. We had an ADD uh, guy on a doctor. His name is uh, Dr. Ned uh, Hallowell. Mm -hmm. And within like 30 seconds, he was just like, you got it. <laughs> it's like, oh, thank you. Uh, like oh, he was like, that? yeah, yeah. Why you uh, wanted to keep moving it along? Yeah. <laughs> well, you got to get going here. Yeah, yeah. He was like, he was like, just from that intro alone. <laughs> He's like, it, like, I think everybody that? has it. Yeah, right. So yeah, do I. A bunch of something, yeah. No, I mean, but but lots of people, um, like, I didn't know what I had. I had OCD, didn't mm -hmm. realize it. Right. Never never once asked why, asked myself why I go through these rituals, mm -hmm. you know, or just sitting there and trying to match a pen to a pencil parallel. Right. You know, uh -huh. while you're talking to somebody, and it's like, why do you have to do that? I don't right. know. It's like, I kind of do, but, you know, you never... You never question it because you've always done it. Sure. And, did did you know, doing voices and characters and stuff like that kind of help you with those things and help you with the autism and stuff? Um, yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm not um, heavily affected, like on the spectrum. I'm. I'm high functioning. Yeah. But when I was a kid, I couldn't get my mind around anything. Nothing made sense to me because everything was upside down, backwards. Right. Um, trying to understand, I had reading, um, reading, learning disability kind of stuff. And, you know, and that's so funny because I still do. And look at the business I'm in. I'm supposed to read, you know, lines. Okay, yeah. Okay, we got 80,000 lines. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And know, that's but, the thing that because... I, I have to do it and, and I try valiantly and, you know, yeah, but it's cool. It, it, in a way, it's kind of like, an odd superpower to have that stuff if you can hone it because it kind of makes up who you are. You know what I mean? It's it's your way your brain works and the way you think and the way you interpret voices and stuff like that. All that comes from the same place, you know? Yeah, I think it does. Um, I just didn't realize that there weren't even names for half of this stuff. Right. You know, so um, and then I started thinking about it during um, quarantine, during lockdown and all that stuff. I didn't mm -hmm. want to just sit around and keep I did anyway. I kept going to the refrigerator, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, a few <laughs> of us did. My, twiddling my thumbs and going, you know, there's a there's a cheesecake somewhere. <laughs> bits. Cheesecake and bits. Um, <laughs> you know, so so I would go have it. And, uh, and then I began to notice I was gaining weight. And I said, you better fucking do something, get constructive. So I started writing about how I was treated by my dad as a kid. And then it just turned into a whole thing. I realized that I had done so many things in my life that I never stopped to think about half of them. You know, it just right. whizzed by. I'm every, yeah. I've been working for 40 years. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, I remember my first days in um, Boston radio mm -hmm. and, um, you know, to me, it's like, what happened? <laughs> you know, I mean, you wake yeah. up, it's, it's, you know what it is? It's like that talking head song, you know, and you may find yourself yeah, yeah. <laughs> working or <with> graduating. <laughs> you may find yourself, how did I get here? You know, right. Yeah. Cause, cause you don't notice, you know, you're supposed to, but everything's kind of a, a blur, especially if you're doing many things at once. Yeah. Yeah. Was it, did stuff come back to you relatively easily or did you have to make phone calls? Like, I always wonder when people are putting a memoir together or something like that together and they're digging through their past, is mm -hmm. it all like you sitting alone in a room trying to piece it together? Or were you like, hey, where were we in 86? No, I, um, it's so funny because uh, people that read it, I think there's people that know because I've talked about it before, but I had quite an alcohol and um, cocaine problem. Mm in the uh, 70s and 80s and um it was it was gonna destroy me i mean i was a musician that's where i started and that was part and parcel to that life you know where you right 
you go to bed at 5 a.m. and you don't come to life until 4.30 and then you go out and play again and right. the cycle starts all over. And then I was working in radio and I would just, I'd come in and I have to like splash my face and go to work yeah. after being out all night, um, getting no sleep, you know, doing drugs to stay up and to go to bed and, you know, the whole thing. Sure. And, um, I, in my soul, I was like, I knew that it wasn't right to be doing this. It was a soul killer, mm -hmm. but, um, I don't know. It's just something that I had to go through. I guess it's the, um, the Kurt, the Irish curse, you know, Madam Bottle, <laughs> your muse. What was the thing that brought you out of it? Um, I smashed up a car doing about 120 on the Massachusetts Turnpike. It went through the solid guardrail and upside down on the other side. Wow. In the way of traffic oncoming. But since it was oh, the middle shit. of the night, I was lucky. But I was upside down in that car and a trooper came, and yanked me out of it. And he said, before I arrest you, I just want you to know that I've been working this shift for 12 years. And every time I see something like this or any of us see something like this, we show up with shovels and a bag, wow. you know, to scoop what's left of you, that jello, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Off the front seat. Right. No, I mean, and, uh, and I was like, yeah, imagine, you know, he wanted to belt me because I was, I was acting like, like a candide, you know, like this innocent, like, Gee, this never happened to me before. Right, you know, right. I almost died. Yeah. And That's he was great. like, he wanted to kill me. It's always earth shattering no matter what it is. You know what I mean? But I can't imagine flipping over on the other side when so much, so much could happen to you in that one yeah. moment. Oh, I know. And, and thinking of what could have been, should have been enough to make me stop, but it wasn't. Um, I was supposed to go to court mm. a year later and I never showed up. So, and I had no idea there was a warrant out for my arrest. So oh my God. I was still screwing around, still drinking and everything. And I got, I had to go to court for non-payment of rent. Wow. And the judge all day long there, the, the lawyers are meeting in the dockets and this and the steno and, you know, and I'm going, what's going on? Why is this taking so long? It's like practically the end of the day. Right. The guy finally gets to me and he's got those little half glasses, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Looking at me, and his name was Judge Umana, and he was a hanging judge. <laughs> no, he was one of those like you know, he he was born with a stomach ache. Right. Kind of <laughs> so uh, he said, "I don't know about this non-payment of rent, but uh, you're doing uh, you're doing two weeks in Charles Street Jail." Oh shit! Wow, went to jail. <laughs> Oh hey, my I've never God. been here before. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was like that. You know, it's like I, I was innocent, but I was a fucking prick. I was a devil, you know, because right. I was messed up with alcohol and, and drugs. But but once I was confined, I said, how did I get here? How how did this ever happen? And you think back and, you know, I was a quick study. Luckily, I learned real fast. I went to a rehab right after that. Yeah. McLean's hospital. A lot of people would go. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when I was there, they they dragged Steven Tyler from Aerosmith in there. And wow. Rick James was in there. Yeah. Good lord. Yeah. This was um a hall of fame. Yeah. Know, <laughs> but um, but I got it. I I was a quick study. I got it. It was 30 days, and I got out of there and I was like another person. No one knew what to do with me because right. they were so used to this person that was a volatile mix of, of like super talent and super demonic stuff. And, you know, it was yeah. horrible. It's hard but, to reconcile. Cause it's like, you know, some people talk about it where it comes with the territory of being in that or any kind of profession like that or in the art. And then yes. there's the, also the people who believe that without it, they don't have their creative ability. Well, yeah. what you find out is you were, you were practicing medicine without a license. Like what made you want to drink like that? To, right. Not, not to just um, drink to, to be high, but to drink till you're practically dead. Yeah. And it means that you're hurting some, there's a loose wire, a bare wire that you don't want to touch. Right. And so you're medicating, you're pouring 
ooze or coke all over it. Is it um, is it where in the beginning there's there's like a uh, like a curve where there's like actual enjoyment, but then at some point it dips and there's no enjoyment and it's just pain. Yes, um, it's um, like what uh, what is the old saying? It's like um, one a hundred drinks isn't enough, and one is too many. Right, right. Yeah, there ain't enough booze on the street where I live. You know, to make me happy. Yeah. Yeah. So I quit everything like 30 years ago. Nice, man. Congrats. But, but getting out of there was like you had to learn who you were. Mm -hmm. How, you know, I didn't know what it was like to be outside after 7 p.m. without being schnuckered. Yeah. 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 That's a weird thing, too, is I feel like even during this pandemic, you kind of think people, I think, started to realize that they didn't know who they were. Because without their job and the thing that they're used to doing and everything, they actually were faced with who the hell am I as a person? I'm stuck inside with me all fucking day long. And I don't even know me. I was a guy that wouldn't leave the refrigerator. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, I, I, th I think, I think at one point I was literally, I know some people either, either drank during the whole thing and rediscovered their love for that kind of shit. For whatever reason, I remember sitting on my couch and just like, I was too lazy to cut the, uh, the slice up cheese and crackers. So I just unopened the package, bit it, and then would shove crackers in at the same time. And I, I remember just sitting there thinking mm. like, I have to move. Yes. I, I have to start that's, doing Boy, it. that's living in the moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I'm going to enjoy every bite. I'm going <laughs> to breathe every breath of air. Right. Yeah, exactly. I'm going <laughs> to do something what was so were you when you when that stuff was going on were you doing the radio gigs at the time or where were yes. you career-wise okay, i okay. was doing radio in boston <clears throat> so and what did I you was, i was good supposedly <laughs> um i just don't remember a lot of it supposedly is such a good way to so you're like i remember somebody told me i was doing radio i don't know who somebody said that i was amazing and all this and that and i said <laughs> yeah whatever you say i couldn't wait to get out of there so i could right go, go on my wild adventure yeah. And so you went from Boston to New York and that was so in between yeah. that you were still in recovery mode. Um, yeah, I was I was clean. And I went to New York. Nice. Um, was was it hard going to New York? Because that's another area that's like very heavily, you know, if you're in a scene, you're in a scene, you know. Well, you know, it's like I, I totally dismissed it. It was almost like I never did it. Wow. That's I, great. I forced myself from it. I still do. People that know me. Mm -hmm. And I tell them these stories about how I went to Peru with five other chuckleheads to have a drug vacation. Oh, they, they think that I'm lying and I'm making up this story, but they say, right. I can't imagine you like, I can't even imagine you screaming at anybody or hitting anybody. No. Yeah. And I, and I said, yeah, but that's exactly the way I was. Wow, man. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's, that's crazy. I would have never guessed it either. Not, not yeah. for a second. If some, if I had to bet money on it, I would have lost. Yeah. Um, yeah you're like, how could this little pussy last so long? <laughs> no, strike that. We're cutting that. Uh, no, <laughs> I did not say that. No, I, um, um, I, I would get into fights. I'd look for trouble, you know? Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm, so I'm very, very lucky in so many regards, you know, so many different levels of being lucky. Do you remember a point? Cause again, so it was Boston, New York, then you're working for Howard Stern. Was there, a point in your career where you were like, oh, sweet, I'm at a sweet spot right now. And I finally bridged that gap, like animation wise, maybe TV show wise. Um, uh, my wife used to get mad at me <clears throat> because nothing was happening fast enough for me. Oh, wow. She said, do you know that you're in New York? Some It takes some people 25 years to put a dent in the place. Yeah. And I said, that's that won't do. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like, I came into New York like a Terminator. <laughs> yeah i i wanted to uh i wanted to conquer <laughs> but i was um but i was a good guy and i and i wasn't like i wasn't one of these people that like there was a lot of people that i met that had that professional kind of resent yeah you know like at auditions and other people were like you know um don't want to give you the time of day Hey, right. how you doing? Good, good. I'm okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Could you not bother me while I'm studying my lines? Right. Everyone's a threat. Yeah, everybody's a threat. It's 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 a weird. That's the thing of uh one of my one of my best friends who I go out on the road with all the time. Um, she and I met that way. We were at a club, 
mm-hmm. together and none of the you know comedians some of us are dicks uh we uh <laughs> <laughs> just to put it mildly but like we were we were both we were younger and we were both doing stand up and both kind of semi new to it and it was one of those situations where people just weren't talking to each other as if they were the enemy and we were the only two that were like we bonded over that. We were like, man, nobody fucking says anything to anybody at these things. And then we just started talking and we formed a friendship and now we go on the road together and shit. And uh, do you think it's because a lot of people didn't know who they were outside of their act? 100%. That's okay. a great way to put it. That's what I think. Yeah. They had this awkward. one thing. It was awkward. Like, what do I say? I don't know what to say without being a yada yada machine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they're like, you know, oh, I have the- to test bits on you. And you're like, yeah, no, no. yeah, I'm working my stuff. Yeah, and I, I um I was very lucky. Uh, I did stand up very briefly and oh, nice. sporadically, but I didn't like it because you had to have an act, right? And I used to just go out there and throw shit against the wall. Sometimes it would work, sometimes it would be beautiful and finding stuff in front of people, and mm-hmm. yeah. And then other times you go to hell in a twisted metal fireball. See, here's a <laughs> weird thing. I've been doing stand-up for 16 years. I had no idea you had to have an act. I really have to go back and rethink. No, I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> that's no, I mean, that's how I started. I just yeah. didn't, you know, I just didn't think about those did things. You, did you have like a crew, like a, a bunch of guys that you had hung around with artistically? Or like stand-up-wise or even? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I, I came from a period of time where I knew the guys in Aerosmith. Because oh I was in a band and we had the same manager. Mm-hmm. as those guys and our agent would say you gotta go out to this club in Revere, massachusetts <laughs> um aerosmith is playing wow and, and so me and my bass player we go out there and we're getting drunk and we're watching these guys on stage banging into each other all out of tune and everything and i looked at them and i said these guys are never gonna make it <laughs> Besides, <laughs> what kind of a name is aerosmith right you know, oh, and, that's I, great. and i became very close with uh with steven tyler wow. particularly and joe perry and the rest of them i knew all of them yeah uh, wow. when they lived in an apartment in brookline massachusetts it's like a quart of beer was heaven those kind yeah. of days yeah yeah and uh and i knew pete wolf from jay giles band oh nice man yeah and um and he was uh an inspirational person to be around he was a real artist you know i never thought of myself as an artist i just thought i was you know like a will of the wisp or something you know just like this sonic the hedgehog that goes plowing through life you know yeah what was the thing that got you out of the band and into voice acting though because i feel like you had a real passion for music um mm, they took away my spandex license in 1978 (laughs) <laughs> oh that's great no um i i just i was having troubles because i was messed up and i got thrown out of a band that i started and cool. um it never got better from there and so um i started going to the comedy clubs mm. because because i was looking for an outlet i wanted to i wanted to perform and here i was not playing anymore and yeah but on stage um, when we broke a string or an amplifier blew up, I would launch into these impromptu, you know, voices and stuff like that. We didn't have roadies. Right. And, uh, you know, so people, I think people like that better sometimes than the music. Mm-hmm. But, um, <laughs> but I remember after I sobered up, I opened up, uh, there was a club in, uh, New Hampshire called Hampton beach casino. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of big acts played there. And George Carlin played there. I opened up for him. Oh, no way. I worked at the radio station. And oh, they that's said, so great. I grew up and I said, you know, I was fearless. I just said, yeah, why not? Wow. And um, and uh, I guess he he got a load of me and uh, he came, came backstage and um, I made him laugh. Mm. Yeah, he told me a joke and I went, Is that yours? <laughs> Because that's what all comedians do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that yours? <laughs> yeah, so I did that to him. He cracked up laughing. He was dying and he, he liked me. And he said, man, how come you're not doing this all the time? You got the chops. I said, I just, there's just something in me that is is keeping me from going that way. And I have a feeling that it has to do with vocal, doing voice work. Yeah. 
you but knew. I hadn't, I hadn't arrived anywhere really. Right. That did you did you stay in touch with George? Um, no, not really, not really. Um, but I but I was, uh, you know, I mean, he he was uh, he was the best of the best. Yeah. You know, any comic will tell you that. Um, we had he, we had his daughter on, and and she it was cool because I feel like gave it him coming up to you and taking a liking to you and an interest in talking. It was he was such he seemed just very generous to young entertainers, you know. He was and, extremely like, generous of spirit. Mm, you know, how do you make awesome. George Carlin laugh? Right. And that's the first thing that was going through my mind. So I just get ballsy and he tells me this joke and he expects me to laugh. I go, Is that yours? <laughs> <laughs> of course it's his. Right. That's all he does. Yeah, yeah. That's so yeah. Great. That's the best. That's one of those things that you never see. I like that you you remembered that part because I feel like when I've met people that have been idols of mine and, and stuff like that or whatever, and you make them laugh, it just, it keeps you going. When, especially when you're a younger comic or anybody mm -hmm. in this business, like that shit is fuel where, yes. you know, you, if you bomb in front of 200 people, you're like, Oh my God, fuck. That's awful. I had the worst set or whatever. But if somebody you admire gives you like, even like a thumbs up, you're like, I'm ready. I'm going back yes. out. Yes. I mean, I, I didn't take it seriously and you have to have, I do know that you have to have incredible discipline yeah. to, be, um, to be a comic. Um, and it's so funny. I don't do it, but yet I'm really, I'm super close to Gilbert Gottfried. Oh. Yeah. I, I mean, He's the best. I, I always got him. Yeah. And for some reason he, he likes me because I've been on his podcast a bunch of times. Yeah, he's, he's I love his podcast. He's great. We were just talking, we were talking to Dave Thomas the other day, and I had um I, I was on with Dave Thomas. Were you really? Oh my yes. god, that's so great. Yeah, that's we crazy. Were doing, yeah. uh, we, he was doing this old Bob Hope and I was doing old Lucille Ball. Oh my god. And that it must was have been... it was so funny. Oh god. Wow. Yeah, and whenever I go on there, I talk about stuff that particularly interests me in a peripheral way and he he's totally into that stuff yeah yeah you know like like the monsters the relationship that al lewis had with fred gwynn right you know and i said sometimes when you're watching the monsters they they dubbed in stuff after the fact after they yeah. filmed it like to explain the scene better but yeah but they had to have one of the characters say it so they wait till the one of the characters back is turned and then they bring in Al Lewis to, to throw in a line, but they never matched room tones. You know, <laughs> come on, Carmen, come on, we got to get this done. And then all of a sudden you, you'd hear, look what you did, you big dummy. You locked us in the bank vault. Yeah. Oh, you know, God, yeah. It's like he was in a closet recording that. And meanwhile, he's on a sound stage right. with the other stuff, but they never matched it up. And that used no. to kill me. So Gilbert, of course, went nuts over that. Yeah, it's great. I, I used to work with Gilbert a bunch when I was younger, and we'd done like a bunch of shows together. And we mm -hmm. were doing one, um, and it was in a bad, you know, it's like a comedy club in a hotel kind of situation. And we weren't yes. that thrilled. Like we went separately to our rooms before the show, and I texted him, and I was like, "How's your room?" And he texted me back, and he goes, uh, "And he goes, if if I was on the second floor, I would jump." <laughs> he's, yeah he goes he goes if i thought it would kill me i would jump oh wow <laughs> just like that is the best it's i, I say that old running rat <laughs> exactly i saved that text i was like that is fucking hilarious yeah even in text he's um he's up there like in in my world because i am a huge well i mean i came from my idols when i was a kid besides mel blank were sid caesar yeah. And Jonathan Winters. Um, I grew up in the 50s. So my mom luckily let me stay up to watch your show of shows with Sid Caesar and Carl nice. Reiner, Imogene nice. Coca, and um, Howard Morris. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those people were, they were giants. They were gods, you know, and yeah. that's kind of where I started. So, so I had an affinity for that guy. And I finally, I got to work with him. Oh, After no way. a million years, you know, it's like I told him uh, how I sat there when I was like six or five years old in the 50s, just sitting watching every little thing he did wow. and, and wondering how can these things come out of a person? They don't come out of my uncle. You know, they don't come <laughs> out of my friend. Up the street. Why? How? Right. Yeah. And um, And he had a twinkle in his eye because he realized that I was 
one of those, you know, the spine of his loin somehow. Yeah, yeah. That's good. He was, um, uh, you ever watch the show Whose Line Is It Anyway? Uh, yes. When he was on that, he was, you know, he was older at the time when he, when he yes. was on that show, but he was amazing because he was just so fast still and so quick. Yeah. And it's like you never lose that no matter how old you get. But he would do that double talk thing, which always oh, yeah. floored me. Like, oh, I don't I know. know anybody does that. Well, um, I remember we had lunch with him one time, mm -hmm. and um, and these guys knew that I idolized him and that I loved the routines that he did. And they said, "Billy, show Sid that thing you were showing us." And I was like, "Oh, shut up, shut up!" <laughs> <laughs> and I and I got kind of out there. Suddenly, I'm in the road, and I, you know, and yeah. Um, big <laughs> boobs. Yeah. Oh my god. Fake, fake Italian. Yeah, it's so great. Um, as an Italian, I approve that message. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's it's. You know, I have such admiration for just for voice actors and stuff like that too. And when you're doing something where it's somebody else's, like when you were doing Bugs Bunny. Yes. What's the approach you take with that kind of stuff? Have you been like, oh, I've been doing this forever, so I kind of know? Or do you have to go back and kind of watch to get mannerisms? Like, what's the, you know, doing something that's somebody that you've, you've loved, you know? Well, um, you know, I was exposed to that stuff since a very, very early age. And mm -hmm. um, some of it I could do. Some of it I couldn't do mm -hmm. very well. But um, But I did go back and I watched a lot of stuff and i met mel blank once oh wow and um it was in worcester massachusetts he was giving a lecture at a at an old wooden hall you know this old school hall right and uh he gave a voice and slideshow and he showed a film at the end and then when he was done uh he said if anybody wants to get autographs you know <laughs> could you make a line over here right so I got up and I started body slamming little kids out of the way, <laughs> checking people like a hockey player. And he goes, could you let the little kids go first? And I said, <laughs> that's all, folks. Oh, God. No, but then I went up and, and said hi to him and got his autograph. But, I mean, at least I met the guy. I mean, it was it was one of those, you know, like that painting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Down and there's this dude. Mm -hmm down here trying to get some of that dna you know yeah yeah the sistine chapel like, huh the sistine chapel right that's the hand of God. <laughs> yeah. the chapel. that's incredible yeah um so uh, what is do you have a title for your book um i think working title would probably be like um voices from life voices from cartoons awesome yeah because it's there's so much stuff in there i mean i I've, I've done some hair raising things like i told you you know i mean i took a trip to peru with five yes. other guys. we almost never came back and there's like a whole there's a whole story because it was like one long day mm. you know when you're that messed up the whole world looks like a super eight from woodstock you know too much <laughs> sun exposure everything looks like it's it's covered with light and water and right yeah, that's what I felt like and looked like. But um, but there was others. I mean, uh, I got I was one of those guys that got imprisoned at Phil Spector's house once. Wait a minute, hold on. What? <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, I went over to Phil Spector's house with a friend of mine, and uh, and he has this thing that where he would get messed up and then lock the door and wouldn't let anybody out. Oh my wow. god. Yeah. So and he pulled a gun on me. Um so I mean I got a whole story of that. Yeah, it's it's a lot of interesting stuff like that. I I would again would have never guessed. Yeah. Did you were how well did you know Phil Spector at the time? I didn't know him at all. I was in awe of him because right. everybody was the guy yeah. who invented the wall of sound. Yeah. Um yeah. pulled a gun on me. Oh That's even guess. better. Great I know, story. right? It, yeah, he, that's he, a great story. He did it to everybody. He did it to everybody. And then, you know, he finally uh, went too far. Yeah. But um, there's other stories about how I, um, one of my heroes, one of my idols was Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. Oh, yeah. 
and I wound up not only meeting him, but playing in his band. I played like five gigs with his band as wow. lead guitar player. And this was after I, I quit playing music, you know, I was already right. in a moratorium. And all of a sudden, it's like the mafia, you know. No, you're you're going back in with you. You're going with Brian Wilson, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we played on David Letterman. And oh my God! I've been very, very lucky, but I have such a very. I don't know when I go to these um, conventions. Um, the eighty-year-old buzzards know me <laughs> from Stern. Right. And they're like, I remember you on Stern. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you were pretty fucking dirty. <laughs> and um and the thing was we weren't dirty i mean we you couldn't use dirty words i right. made them up i made up a word one time for junt <laughs> <laughs> that's even better is that the vajunt alarm that i'm yeah <laughs> yeah we only allow a couple of vajunts on here before we okay. get canceled so okay. that's yeah <laughs> you get that's, the, mean, that's, that's the one vajunt beep but we had to do that because you could not just come out and swear so or be right. vulgar so you got really clever about it i know you, you probably wouldn't want to do like a stand-up thing again because of the structure but what about putting a one-man show kind of thing together about the book like maybe after the book comes out or about your life you ever thought about that um maybe i don't know but i'm i'm gonna be really busy <laughs> that's true yeah you got some you got some uh, cartoons good futurama and ren and stimpy i got right. you know i gotta save up uh, some energy for that stuff yeah, I, Futurama. So it's literally it's like one of the best cards. I it's in my top. It's in my top five. And I know this is probably like what people say to you, but I. No, I'm honored it. to hear that. I, top I really five am. best shows of all time. I don't uh, take anything for granted. I never had a sense of entitlement. Uh, if I won an award, I'd probably give it back. You know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I've never. I've never been even nominated after all these years for an Emmy for voiceover, and it's like Crazy. I don't care because. I don't give a shit about that stuff, you know, right, and right. I'd be fake if, if I, if I won one and I showed up and I went, this means a whole lot. It doesn't mean shit to me. Yeah. You know, I'm one of the only people that'll probably say that, but. Right. No, I know what you mean. It's hard to fake that kind of stuff. If it's really, if it's just about the work for you and you got to go up and give like a speech, you can almost tell sometimes. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have a speech. I would just, I'd be grateful, you know, just nothing yeah. but grateful, but I show that in, I show it in my work, you know, I mean, I, I never want to let anybody down right. ever. And, and when I did those voices, I told you, I thought long and hard before I opened my mouth because I wanted them to live forever. Yeah. And I wanted them to be like, not just voices that you heard, but you could actually know these people. In real yeah. Life. Yeah. You could actually know them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, that's what I wanted to do for Matt because he, he, you know, trusted me to to interpret them yeah and we have a um i'm a close friend of mine who works on a, a she writes for um disenchantment emily dixon oh wow dixon. Yeah, yes. yeah and she's like i she knew that you were coming on the show and she was like my guy <laughs> so oh, just, wow yeah emily dixon yeah she's great um, um she's one of the writers for disenchantment that's a that is such a great show i mean i have i have some parts you know character parts that i do on it um but the drama is what yep. I get into on that show. Yeah, there's funny stuff in it. Um, the stuff well, I, I do is sort of comedy, comic relief. Right. But that's what I love about Futurama, too. There's so much heart. I mean, you know, everybody knows uh, Jurassic Bark episode. Yes. With Brian. That that's like, that was one of those ones when I was younger, when I first saw it, I was not expecting to get emotional at a cartoon, and it crushed me. I wasn't either, and I read it, and I yeah. recorded it, and I said, this is going to be sad. But I didn't yeah. know how sad. And then right. when I was at home, I went, oh. <laughs> you know, and hugging the cat. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, every everybody knows what it's like to bond with an animal. Pretty much yep. everybody. And you want them to live forever and they don't. And or at least as long as we do and they don't. Yeah. So um you gotta say hello and goodbye to a lot of little friends over the course of your life. And then a new one comes in and it's this whole other new life and a whole new personality and you fall in love all over again. You remember the old ones fondly, mm -hmm. but, uh, but that bond, I mean, I wish I was half the man my stupid cat thinks I am. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? 
You know what's yeah. crazy? I read some not too long ago that cats just think we're bigger cats, but more successful, kind of. Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird? More successful as a cat. I, I added the more successful because I would I like also that. like that. That's my favorite part. <laughs> more <laughs> successful. You. Like, I'm the one that gives out food. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're like, look at him wearing clothes and that's right. going out to the doctor and that's stuff. That's right. I yeah. still have to clean my <laughs> face like this, though. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, man. I've got to, I got to thank you, man. This has been an absolute blast having oh, you on. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Um, we got three three big questions that we ask every guest at the end, so I'm going gonna, I'm okay. gonna to roll those at you. First one is if you can go back in time and talk to your younger self. Um, what piece of advice would you give yourself today that would help you out? Um, don't let those clowns that are supposed to be your friends psych you out. And I'll explain that. It's like I used to work up something. You know, I was a loner, but I would work up something that I thought was cool. And I would do it for these guys. And they just stand there and look at you. Yeah. You know, and. And my older self would go back and tell my younger self, do you know why they act like that? Because you just did magic and right. they don't know what the fuck to do because yeah. you just, you were a painful and constant reminder probably for the most part of stuff that they will never, ever, ever be able to do. How would you feel? I said, I'd hate me too. <laughs> right. I completely agree with that, man. I would. I mean, no wonder they just stood there and just, how friggin' good do you have to be? Yeah. You know, it, to impress these clowns. I, I know exactly what you mean. Jail. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some of them are. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing, too, is, like, people don't realize sometimes how much, like, internal management you have to do of other people's personalities or feelings sometimes. Mm. Because you are at a, at a heightened state you sometimes. You know what I'm down. Yeah, oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's like the it's like the mafia. It's like, um, what was it, the Godfather. And, and um uh, the guy with money pretends to be like, you know, oh shucks, you know. Yep. It's a, it's a trick of the rich to pretend they're ashamed of their money. Oh, that, oh well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, it funny, it can fuck you up too. It can get into your head a little bit sometimes until you realize yeah. that you don't have to actually always do that. Um, I don't know. I didn't get into it. I got into it for people that ask me, you know, what how do I go about this? What do I look for? I said, look, look for yourself, look to find what it is you have to offer and you should be bursting to contribute. You should have like so much uh, resonating inside of you that you you're bursting to contribute. I didn't know you could make any money. I had no idea. I didn't, I never dreamt you could be famous. I just, yeah. you know, I just knew that that's something that I had to kind of move towards in life. And, uh, nice. and then you wind up somewhere, you know? Yeah. And <clears throat> That's the journey is like, that's the thing that I always found funny when I was younger, when I would read about all these people that I admired, they always talked about the journey and how much yes. they, some, you know, they miss the work in between. And I would be like, really? And then it's like, now nah, you got to get it. Yeah. Um, well, at the end, you know, when, when, when you've achieved everything and there was a, a finite nature to it, um, you kind of wish it was going on like you wish that it was mm -hmm. always going on like forever because um you know the objective is not what we think it is the like the journey is the objective right yeah not the end of it or whatever the thing in the bag of gold at the end of the rainbow and then now what you know yeah yeah that's a great way to put it yeah um uh second question Mm -hmm. And I, I may, I feel like we may have touched on a little bit. It could be something different, but what had to end in your life, good or bad, that led you to where you are today? What had to end? Oh, well, I mean, you know, drinking, and drugging, right, yeah. it had right. to end. Or I would have been dead. Right. I would have been dead. I, I almost died a few times. Yeah. And, I, and again, you know, no one would ever believe this, that I was an urchin. You know, I was just like, you know, you know, I I tell people these stories and they go, you're, you're so full of it. You know, you're like a little cupy doll. You know, how could you get into trouble? Oh, right. you don't know, you don't no. know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's the other side. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, And the last question is my favorite because it ties mm -hmm. into the show, Dystopia Tonight. Uh, If this is a genuine dystopia, we're talking alien zombies, comet heading, climate change, everything's on fire. What would be your epic death? How would you want to go out? My epic death? 
Yeah, yeah. How would you want to go out? It's it's the last day for everybody. But what is Billy West doing on that day? Oh God, I never I never imagined that. I mean, and you know what? It's like if I look out my window tonight, the sky might be the color of fire and of the atomic <laughs> cloud. You know, could very know. well it's, happen. It could, uh, yeah, I know. Now we're, it's now, weird. now we don't have to joke about it. It's like, I, you better take some iodine pills, number one. <laughs> Make sure you get those on Amazon. I, I think I'm going to do it. Right, right. But um, I don't know that if I had my druthers about the end, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think you would you think you'd be swept away by aliens? What would you like to be like? Some people were like, I'd like to be, you know, abused by aliens or eaten by, you know, um, it's been, it's weird. You could have any, anything you wanted. If I had Selma Hayek, yeah, blah, 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 blah. All day long, I'd squeeze that little ass. That's, I don't know, probably something like that. All right. That works. If I had, <laughs> that works. That's a, a fiddler on the roof. And How I've dare never heard me before. saying that? How dare me? I... <laughs> no, I, I deserve to be fucking slapped. No, it's just more for the book. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, I dig her. I dig her. And then she's on the SAG Awards. But I don't watch awards because, you know, I'm never going to get one. And, and somehow people got it. People are confused in Hollywood. They think awards equals entertainment for the rest of us. Yeah, I know. I yeah. know. Yeah. Do you? Uh, yeah. There. I don't. When they when they keep fucking talking about canceling that stuff or like you know oh we're not gonna have this award show I'm like oh boo hoo <laughs> like I don't know what to tell you like I guess I'll just you know go about my day I don't know yeah yeah I and think it's, they're just testing to see if you'll be upset if it goes away oh I know which you no, might not do it you know. Well, you know what they did? They they removed any categories that had any humanity. Like it's oh, like no comedians are ever there. You know what I mean? Nobody's there, like having a good time. Nobody's nominated. Like none of the big blockbuster shits nominated that anybody goes to pay money to see. Well, they gotta pretend like, that there's an art still. Right, right. You know, to this, it's like the least likely picture, but has like an artistic bent. You know, like an auteur did it rather than a right. filmmaker. Uh, yeah, I know with that because it's it looks good. Yeah, I know. It's like, can't we just can't we? Ha I don't even mind if we had both, but just let's not pretend that Spider Man wasn't the biggest fucking blockbuster movie in the last three years. You know, know that. And also, the weird thing is too is like when those people. Now I'm going on a tangent. Now I'm like, excuse me. I know you have no, to go, go ahead. ahead. I, I uh, <laughs> oh, great. It's but it is one of those things where you're like, you know, it, it you would have to be like all these old directors come out of the woodwork because their films nobody's driving out to see. You know, um, what was the Irishman that Scorsese did? Well, it was three hours of Robert De Niro in bad CGI. Right. And he can't move the way he used to. So it was weird, you know. Yeah, so it was like dancing with De Niro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dancing with wolves. Yeah. Right, right. And then, but the fact of the matter is, is like, you know, all the guys that are in those Marvel movies or that are in those kind of blockbuster films, which I think they do the best of those versions of those. Mm -hmm. But like, they, I see them in more indie films than any other actors. And you want to know why? Because they're making the money to have, be able to go out and produce and make smaller films. So like, that's the benefit of those films in Hollywood. If you, if you want to balance it out that way, at least now people are able to afford their own side projects and to do yes. more exploratory stuff. Yes. So there you go. That that's a win-win, I think. Good for them. I mean, right. it's just Hollywood. It's not, I think it's probably cause I'm getting older, but Hollywood looks like dressed up 13 year olds. <laughs> you know, here comes this old fart martin short and selena gomez who looks like like she just got out of uh the womb your yes. high <laughs> right you know right she goes back to her mansion and i said it's lil hollywood yeah yeah the adventures of hollywood when it was lil yeah <laughs> I'm begging them not to fuck up Indiana Jones, the the fifth one that comes out. I'm really hoping they don't do the old guy too old for this trope. I mean, like, you know, I mean, Harrison Ford's getting up there, but at least give him his dig, you know, give the character the dignity of not being trying to tweet while he's excavating the, you know, tomb or whatever the fuck. Well, you know, right, just, right. just let him, you know what I mean? When they try to. Well, wasn't they, that a period piece to begin with? It Yeah, it was. It totally was. So I don't know. Yeah, I know. I don't know how they'd update it. I like adventures and all that and everything, oh. but 
Yeah, we have a we have a question from one of the viewers. What gives you fulfillment in life if not the external recognition most people look for? Um, the work mm. speaks for itself, and I'm being totally honest. Is it, if somebody tells you that they really enjoyed something you did, I take it to heart. It makes me feel great. It, it's almost like, well, there's the reason for doing it is that you affected somebody. Sure. Yeah. You. Yeah. You can't. I never played it small. Ever. Mm -hmm. I played it big and over the top because you'll never inspire anybody else that comes along. You'll do no service to the universe. Right. If you, you know, yeah, micro. Have you ever drawn a character yourself that you wanted to submit to a thing and, and maybe had a voice for already prepared? Um, not not that I actually really committed to. I wasn't that good of an artist. I started out wanting to do art, mm. but um I would draw and draw and I was getting good, but, but like, as soon as the guitar came along, ah. I dropped it for music because it was a, it was a quicker fix. Yeah. You know, draw, you have to spend hours if you want to find a certain look or you want to feel a certain way. The guitar, you just pick it up and it responds to the way you touch it. So creatively then, what do you think if, if you were, you know, if you were like really fantastic at drawing, Mm -hmm. because of the way you basically said somebody shows you a character and you creatively think of a voice first. Yes. If you could do both, which do you think would come first? Do you think the character idea would come first or a voice you would draw a character for? I don't know. You're talking to me like I was Matt Groening or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> they, they don't come any more brilliant than him. Right. Um, yeah. he, Heard he's a really nice guy too. No, but when you think of the yeah. amount of characters he's created and he's only done like three shows. I know. Yeah. That have you know, lasted. But, but there's like a thousand characters. Yeah. That he that he worked up and, and that they all had to have personalities and you know personal histories and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and you had to find the, the right voice for them. And you know what I, I was wondering too. I mean, it's gotta be great, obviously, to have a show on um that's really popular and lasts. You know what I mean? Never has a threat of getting canceled. But it was uh, Futurama was on, got taken off, and then there was an outcry to have it put back on. Yes. Does that feel oddly good in a set? Like it's even better? Great, than and I thank people to this day. I said, you guys are the ones that brought the show back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because there were campaigns and, you know, everybody was beginning to, to realize their power on mass because of social media. Right. But then, and then they used their powers for evil. I know. Then it tilted the other way where we're like, yeah. all right, guys, you can fucking stop tweeting now. Uh, <laughs> we wanted out of it. Um, well, listen, I want to keep you any longer. I just no, that's fine. So I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm, I'm really glad, man. You. you can come back on whenever, whenever, absolutely, whenever you want. I threatened uh, to. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I would love it if you just popped up during another, like somebody else is on, and you're just like, I'm here. <laughs> Deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> Slide in. Oh my god. And you, you have a favorite character that you voiced through all these years? Um, I get asked that a lot, and I always have to say um, that I've been lucky enough to do such rich, beautiful characters that I was given um, that I can't pick one over another. I mean, there's something so enjoyable about doing it all, doing yeah, every one of them. I mean, of the ones that I've been, that I created or worked up, I, I always wanted to be an originator rather than a a mimic. I mean, I was mm -hmm. yeah. a mimic. I, you know, I'll do a job as something to hold up a franchise, you know, like, yeah. like bugs and all that stuff. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, but, but it's, it's more thrilling if someone says, you know, shows you this character and you got to go think fast, you got to be on your toes. You know, this guy, this guy has something in his mind and he wants you to hit it. And it could be a, one of a million zillion things. Right. You know, yeah. I, I feel like Zoidberg represents like dystopia tonight. He looks like the perfect dystopia tonight character. I am the perfect dystopia character. <laughs> I'd work to the Oi, my face. Look how fat from all the cake I ate on quarantine. Oi. <laughs> my face. How fat. We. <laughs> 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 I, <laughs> one of one of my one of my good friends her name is sarah simon i gotta tell you this she just embodied zoidberg in such a way that it was like we we love futurama we, all, me and my friends we had a futurama party when it came back on the air 
and oh, Sarah wow. Simon was Zoidberg because she was literally <laughs> like, like a- anything that could happen to this girl. We felt we all worked at a library together. That's when I was doing stand up, but I was still working part time at a library. Right. Anything that could happen to her would happen to her. And really? we would, she would always just say she was Zoidberg because oh it was that, that, you know, that episode where he's got a, um, a slinky. Yes. And he's like, hello, little friend. And it catches fire. Yes. That's the embodiment uh, of Sarah Simon. And, yeah. <laughs> yes. The and Dewey would, Decimal System and Zoidberg. Yeah. And she would always say, um, like literally at the library, if anybody mentioned her for like a good praise, she would just go, yay, somebody noticed me. Just like it would all. A lot of people can identify with that. Yeah. Now Zoidberg is the popular one. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. I. Um, I, Those characters are are so. I don't know. They're just so perfect. So perfect that I I'm honored that I was asked to be part of it and that I get to keep performing it. You know, and I'll keep doing it till they tell me don't come in anymore. (laughs) <laughs> well hopefully that is never man because I i'm gonna still never. watch I really yeah do. i don't want to go i like it too much what i know i got a good 10 years left and i'm gonna be gone no you know i'll make you a deal if they what? ever if they once this is uh uh over you know what i mean let's hope it keeps going on forever but if they do wind up capping this next future drama thing i'll just keep drawing them and you do the voices for me like i'll just, just <laughs> I'll, pay, I'll figure out a way to do it yeah yeah, you have I'm to visit me at the you. nursing home and pay me in pablum. Every now and then at the I nursing home. I only eat pablum for breakfast because I have to, <laughs> <laughs> to gum my food. And Good news, everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll be like, Billy. I, don't want, I know that that's supposed to happen because I've lived it. I worked in nursing homes and I, I met guys that drew the, the plans to the Alaskan pipeline, you know, and they were in their eighties and they still think they're still designing. Yeah. <clears throat> Sitting at the table, eating a scrambled egg, oh trying to God. figure out, well, if, if this pipe goes this way, you know, it's dude, that was a million years ago. Turn left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to wheel you out and be like, they, Billy, they we're having this, a good time. We have this PVC uh, pipe now. So we don't know what it expands or contracts. Yeah, so don't worry about it. Right, yeah. It's over. You can rest don't now. Don't worry about it. Yeah. We got Jeopardy on a loop. You're fine. Yeah, right. I was a question uh, on Jeopardy once. I know. Really? Imagine that. Imagine that. Did you what like how many text messages do you get after your your question on Jeopardy? Like, dude, <laughs> like how do you find out? Matt Graining. Really? Oh, called me. What a great way. Yeah. He said, I was just watching Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, my God. At least at least he didn't see me on the 630 news, you know, like with a rifle from a clock tower. You know? Yeah. <laughs> High powered rifle. <laughs> You'll see. You'll all see. Oh, my God. We had one more question from one of the viewers. It was yeah, um, really. Let's talk to him. Yeah, was there a character you thought you were unable to pull off initially? Unable? Yeah. Mm. A tough one was um, I got hired to do uh, Popeye for King Features. Oh wow! And it was for Fox Television actually, and it was um, it was CGI. Wow! And and I I loved that character. And when I was little, we all used to run around trying to do it, but we all sucked. You know, nobody could get a handle on it, it was like yeah, my olive oil you know <laughs> it's like it yeah something was missing right and i finally realized what was missing is my friend um tony visconti who was a music producer he used to produce david bowie's stuff wow um he said billy there's this film called game is blues and it's playing at the you know some theater in new york mm-hmm. and we went to go see it and it was about a tribe of um they were Mongolians, Tuvans. Tuva is a country above Mongolia. So okay. it was all these guys and they worked, they did like cowboy work, you know, they 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 wrangled cattle and they they had carts and carriages and you know, and they had the the horse beat culture. Like mm-hmm. uh, that's where country western music got its beat from. Oh. Yeah, so it's like, you know, eh. Yeah. Back in the saddle again. <laughs> and um, so anyway, they had the same thing going on. But when they went to sing, it was like. Yeah. 
<laughs> throat singing, Tuvan throat singing. And I said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. It sounds like a woods full of Popeyes. And I realized oh it was a high voice and a low voice at the same time. So, you olive oil, I bring you some flowers. <laughs> and then I'm like, you olive oil, I bring you some flowers. Yo ho, olive oil, I bring you some flowers. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's incredible. I see, I that's the kind of thing I would have never have thought that like people combined voices and like grabbed from all different areas. But like after like I've I've like read a few interviews and stuff with you and I like the way you kind of go like, okay, this place is from this place. This accent's from here. This is from my life. And then you combine it into making it a thing. It's, it's like, well, you know what it is? It's, it's like any other thing that you yourself want to do is you have to, you have to know the form. Mm. You have to be totally familiar with the form that you're, you're working with. And as soon as you're so familiar with it, then you break it into pieces and F with it. Right. You know, it's like Jeff Beck, you know, he just doesn't play 12 bar blues. Right. He knows it intimately inside yeah. and out. But, but like by the time he gets done with it, it's like, it's celestial, it's stratospheric, it, it, you know, it's sonically um, riveting. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Max Wasson wanted me to say uh, thank you for what you did for Jesse, by the way. Oh, Max. I was happy to do that. Please, you know, signed a little thing. Yeah. From those Funko Pops. Uh, oh, the Funko Pops are like so popular. Yeah, they, those are so popular and I'm, I don't know why. Um, somebody asked if you had done a uh, Drawn Together. Did you voice a character in Drawn Together? Yeah, I did. I'm trying to remember what I did though. I don't, yeah. I think I, I did a security guard or something. Oh, nice. <laughs> you ever Astro Astronaut number one. You you totally don't have to answer this, by the way, because I've or maybe I'll disguise it in a way that's not. But do you ever see? Because I have one in mind, and I probably shouldn't say it on the air. Uh, do you ever see a voice done from a beloved character from a long time ago where you're like, I could fucking do that better than that guy? Do you know what I mean? And you're just kind of like, when I was really, when I was much younger, like when I was in my twenties, I mm. I want I was like Jack the Giant Killer, you know? I said, just let me out there, right. Just let me out there. Laugh it up, laughing boys. I'm going to take all your friggin' jobs. <laughs> oh, I love it, man. Yeah. That's so great. What's so hard about getting discovered? Somebody sees a diamond on the floor and they have enough sense to pick it up. Ooh, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. yeah. What's so hard about this? Yeah. No, that's I mean, I, I, I came through real quick because I, I, New York was very, very good to me, not just because of the radio, but Madison Avenue was listening to the Stern show. Everybody was listening yeah. to the Stern show. So they would call and say, Hey, you know, would you like to go audition for this or that? And I went on every audition and I still do. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm told that I don't have to, but, but I, um, I, I'm an old school. I have immigrant mentality, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, if you want to work, you got to audition. Yeah, probably keeps you humble too. Yeah, and it's and it's a little intimidating, you know. It's like starting over, and you got to impress a room full of kids, you know, that are like less than half your, more than half your age, really. Right, right. But we remember you, because <laughs> I used to watch Doug. <laughs> Doug's it. Like, yeah. Every time I go into my closet, I think of Doug because there was that yeah. episode where he goes into his closet and every single thing is the same exact outfit, like over and oh, over. Oh, right. It's the first time you saw into a cartoon character's closet, you know, for the first time. Like, why is he wear the same thing? Well, they're older now because yes. like 20, 25 years have passed. And it's like, right. You know, Dear Journal, today I blew up a courthouse. <laughs> <laughs> Federal <laughs> Magistrate Judge Roger yeah. Klotz. Oh, look who's in my courtroom. You loser. <laughs> I knew I was going to see you someday in here, you loser. Buddy. You know. You're going to jail. You're going to jail for 100. No, 500 years. You get guilty written all over your face. It's spelled wrong. Jail. And then, oh, no. <laughs> I heard Roger Klotz was actually at the Capitol insurrection. That's just a rumor. Uh, I heard <laughs> Not 100% sure. Oh, that makes me laugh. <laughs> I want my freedom. I want my freedom to ruin things and wreck everything. <laughs> oh my God. That just made it's my happening. night, man. I think, 
now that I think about it, we started this interview and I was talking about autism, but there's mm. this, there's this explosion of births where the autism rates are going up mm. and no one can figure it out. Right. And I think it's evolution. I think it's taking place right in front of our eyes because wow. something has to intervene to counter counteract the stupidity and the ignorance and you know what I mean? It's like right. America's going to collapse under the weight of its own idiots. And so there's all these sensitive people that have that are artistic and gifted and stuff. They just haven't found the key to that storage room right upstairs. But they do, like you said, superpowers. Yeah, absolutely. And I, think, I think that nature's not going to sit there and look the other way while we go south as a society. Yes. You know what I mean? It's not going to go, oh, I'm sorry, I have nothing to do with this. No, right. it's going to intervene like it always has and always will. That's a beautiful way to look at it. One of my, you know, um, got people in my family who are exactly, you know, in the same boat. And it's kind of nice to have that kind of optimism about it, too, because it's very frequently not looked at like that. I you think know? I, I just I see plenty of it because at these shows, it's like um, <clears throat> there are artistic people like they're into the arts they're into yeah. comic book art they're into fantasy and sci-fi and those are all highfalutin things that require tons of imagination yeah and they they do that and they want to be they want to be part of it and they want to get and they feel awkward and they feel like they can't express it and right. and I bring it up and so many people come up and say you were talking about my life and and I said, well, I kind of I kind of know. I mean, I'm not I wasn't bogged down too much, but I did have learning disabilities. But I I had a whole other world going on in my head. And if I couldn't yeah. get it out there, but I wanted to be part of this this world that was not, you know, of my neighborhood or my block. It was sure. movies and television and records, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's the part that says, you know, I I I want to have something to offer. I don't want to go in there empty-handed. Absolutely. Do you know Do you know a guy named Ken Robinson? He passed away last year, I think, but he was um, um. Oh my God, he wrote a he wrote a ton of books about education. Um, and he was a he gave this amazing uh, TED talk, which is yeah. probably not something I, I've said very often. But he really it was when TED talk was good. So it was like 2004 ish or whatever. And it was um, called how schools kill creativity. Oh yeah. It was so good. And I can, I, I just found out that he had passed away a year ago. I think his daughter has been doing a bunch of stuff because they're putting a book out or a book that he was about to put out. Oh, and, I get um, it, you know, yeah, but it was, it was so great. He told this story about uh, this kid at one point where they tried to, you know, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. Right. And they wanted the school wanted the parents to send them her to all these doctors and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were going to put her on some thing or whatever. And he took her, they took her to this one doctor and he would talk to her for a little bit. And then he told his mom, you know, you know what? Um, just, uh, you know, the, the notes were all, she can't sit still in class. You know, she's a dreamer. She's constantly doing something else. She's not focused. So he talked to her for a little bit and then was like, would you mind? Can I talk to you privately? He said to her mom, and then he turned the radio on and left it on in the in the room. And then when he walked up with the mom and he's like, just wait one second and watch. And when she was alone in the room and no one was looking, she started to dance. And he was like, there's nothing wrong with her. She's just a dancer. And he's like, put her in a dance school. And he did. And she's like literally in the ball. Like she wound up being like the premier ballerina for the you know country or whatever. And it was uh, but it, it, amazing to me because I always think like how many kids like that were left behind because they were either overly medicated or not understood. Not understood um, is the thing. Like nobody, I spoke to my aunt one time and I hadn't talked to her for a really long time. And she remembered the old days and mm. she said, um, nobody knew what to do with me. You know, she just said, you were a weird kid. I mean, nobody knew what to do with you. Right. You know, cause, cause once I came out of myself, I was like a gakiran, you know that word? Yes, I do. You do. Yes, I do. Absolutely. You need to get the yeah. Machine. Yeah. Yeah. Got And yeah. so, um, so she said you were, you were like a handful, but no one could figure out what to do with you. Uh -huh. And I hated school. School mm -hmm. used to make me nauseous. 
and yeah, uh, and I would go to school. They used to show the Three Stooges in the morning before I went to school. So I'd go go to school with a head full of that and yeah, and yeah, this hatred and disdain of academia. You know, yeah. and everything I learned in school, I think about it. Every single thing I learned, um, all the way up to high school, would do me absolutely no good in the year two thousand twenty-two. Oh Not yeah, one iota. I should have never gone to school. And I remember being in a music class and I was vocalizing one time and the teacher said, stop it like that. He was like, he was like, you can't, you're not supposed to be able to do those things. Mm. Imagine somebody saying that to you. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's crazy. Like, well, the that's all I was ever met with. So, yeah. So I felt like, um, I don't know. It's, it, it was like training, running with rocks on your back, you know, and then one day you take them off and your feet leave the ground. <laughs> That's what it was like. Yeah. Yeah. It was like one of the reasons I learned to draw in the first place was because I didn't like going to school, but I thought if I can take the things I love with me and I could yes. draw on whatever I wanted, that was, then I could have an escape no matter where I was. Well, somebody outside of that environment could use you and your talent or your skills. Right. You can't use it where you are. Right, right. You're just like a useful idiot. You know, I got to pass somebody or fail somebody. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. We um, have a million. The questions just keep firing yeah, over yeah. from the other side. Oh, yeah? I'm just going to draw a Let's couple more. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't uh, care. What is your favorite animation of all time, regardless of whether you acted in it or not? Um, I There was a cartoon that Warner Brothers did um, back in the 30s, and it was called I Loved a Singer. Oh yeah, and it was a it was like the three little owls, owl in the yeah, owl family, and the dad was a music teacher, and uh, you know he of course when the mother gave birth and the little eggs, you know he opens up one and the kids playing a flute, mm -hmm. goes, ah a Chrysler, you know Fritz Chrysler, <laughs> and he goes, ah a Heifetz, you know somebody playing the violin, right, and then right. This one kid comes out and he goes, I love singer like the moon <laughs> and the genie and the springer. I like seeing her, and he goes, Ugh, a corona. No, get out. He throws him out of the house. Right. And, uh, and and it reminds me of like when I was a little kid, he had to go to town by himself. And, mm -hmm. you know, and he's singing as he's walking along and, um, you know, they didn't get him. And then he yeah. winds up on a talent show and uh, he's kicking ass. And all of a sudden he sees his family in the window and he gets all intimidated and starts singing. Mm -hmm. You know some some beaten up old songs because his father would get mad at him for being right. a jazz singer yeah 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 but that was a know, great one it, it was a beautiful cartoon it's filmically beautiful and touching yeah got yeah. a great message and it connected mm -hmm. i have a giant poster of it framed of, of a scene from that cartoon in my room oh, wow. here somewhere oh nice very very nice <laughs> that's incredible also, we got. Are you going to be part of the new proud family coming out? Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Why well, you know something? <laughs> that was a question from the crowd, but I hope so. <laughs> I a couple of turns on it, but um, not that I know of. The uh, let me see if we have another one. Yeah, the other one. We just keep that'd be great if we just kept announcing cartoons he didn't know he was going to be in. You know, we got another <laughs> one. <laughs> We're just getting in. <laughs> They're bringing everything back now. If you, you know what? Here's a good one. If you could reboot, reboot a show, uh, what would it be? Because they're doing all of them now. Reboot a show? Yeah, yeah. Something that they, yeah, a favorite of yours. Um, it's impossible to explain it, but there was a show called Colonel Bleep. Oh, and it was on a million years ago. Turn left. Mm. And uh, Colonel Bleep was a spaceman, but he wasn't from Earth. Okay. And, and he had two companions. One was a puppet named Squeak uh. and a caveman named Scratch. <laughs> and the announcer was manic. He would scream at the top of his lungs, you know, and I. And I took that as the inspiration for Space Madness, where the announcer is so high powered and he's he's emphasizing all the wrong words. Right. And, yeah, because I thought that would be funny. Um, and um, you know, that's it came from a show called Colonel Bleep. Oh, I had no idea. You I'm can gonna... look it up. It's probably on YouTube, and you're going to hear this crazy sound. 
Yeah. And I don't know how they made it to this day. I don't know how they made it. Wow. Oh man, yeah, I definitely will look that up. When it shows he's, he's in action, his his legs go, tick, 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 <laughs> and, and uh, there's a there's a sound effect, but it, it drives me nuts. It haunts me. Oh things. my god. Oh yeah, yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. Have you ever voiced the Muppet? No. Would you? What would be? Would you want to? Would I want to? Yeah. I I don't covet anything that I am not doing. I mean, I've been very very lucky. I'm totally at ease with everything I've done. I am an appreciator of other mm. people's work right like i said i all the people that i work with i mean i i am their biggest fans you know yeah yeah really truly yeah the, the beautiful voices that i get to hear the 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 art behind it you yeah. know it's it's surreal that's awesome yeah. well I, again i feel like i've said it i feel bad i kept you for so long but thank you for so staying go. So go. who's holding you no <laughs> <laughs> no thank you so so much for doing my this, pleasure. It's been a pleasure i was glad to do it thank you really it's been Thanks a blast so man sure guys yep and have a good time man i hope futurama lasts forever oh i hope so too yeah absolutely we'll Look again. again have a great yep. one thanks Bye -bye. <laughs>